Hello everyone and welcome back to more AEW and TEW 2020. We are here in the first week of May, starting our road to double or nothing. We start off with Wardlow still getting some of the ring rust off uh, from his year-long absence by defeating QT Marshall in a pretty quick match. After this occurs, Judah defeats Layla Hirsch. Uh, Hirsch, great rating. You know what? That's fine. That's fine. Donnie Lambert then defeats Anthony Owens. Uh, that was not what was supposed to happen. Uh, that was a... I'll, I'll explain it in the next segment. So, Brian Pillman Jr. ended the match early by battering down both of them with a steel chair. He doesn't really care that he gave a win to Donnie Lambert. Uh, he's just there for the violence. Two tag partners of the participants. Uh, I imagine that... Leo and Caster were at ringside as well for the singles match. Frederick Hurst also out there, but Hurst doesn't get into the ring. Tag partners do. Dijak is there. That's probably why Hurst doesn't enter. Takes out both Caster and Leo easily with just how big he is. Dijak's a massive man. Uh, very strong, very good. Uh, Pillman then just sets up his chair in the middle of the ring as Dijak is, you know, he tosses all of the opponents out of the ring. He's stomping around, he's looking intimidating, and Pillman Jr. just looks like an absolute douchebag. He's just, like, sitting back, he's, like, leaning back at the steel chair. He's, like, looking up at this guy. He's just being an absolute douchebag. Abaddon then defeats the Bunny. Proud and Powerful defeat the Lexing Brothers, uh, known in NXT as the Creed Brothers. Uh, I named them the... Lexi Brothers, because they are uh, Drew and Jacob Casper. I don't think those are very intimidating names. So now they are Duke Lexing and David Lexing, uh, both of them from Lexington, hence the Lexing. Uh, Duke, which is Jacob. Uh, he went to Duke. David, and I, I don't know, I just found a name for it. Legitimate athletes. Same gimmick, basically. FDR then defeat Joey Janela and Devon Dudley. The, uh, so TH2 are backstage with Maria de Pasqua when they are approached by uh, Daga, Bandito, and Shaw Guerrero. Daga and Shaw brag to them about how Daga is the Impact Champion. Bandito has three belts. He's the CMML, uh, CMLL Middleweight Champion as well as ROH Tag and Six Man Tag Champion. Uh, and Shaw herself is from a legendary family while TH2... They used to be an okay team, but nothing fantastic, while well, MDP is a complete rookie. The LWO walk off laughing, while TH2 resolve themselves to take down the LWO another notch. Motor City Machine Guns then defeat Will Power. Eddie, uh, Eddie Kingston loses to Andrew Everett. Io Shirai is seen training in a gym when she's approached by Chris Statlander. Chris goes over to boop Io, do more weird alien shit. But once again, Eo slaps the hand away, and she just looks frustrated. She just explodes on Kyra, uh, not Kyra, on Chris Statlander. Says that the alien chick is really stupid. Uh, Chris is someone that deserves way better than to make a fool of herself. Eo storms off. Chris is upset, but she seems to take mental notes like, okay, this is how some people react. This is how some humans react, or some, again, weird alien shit. And then, main event, the Vision defeat the Von Eriks. What a surprise. 68 rating. Um, you'll see on... Well, I don't think we gain anything for Dark anyways, but... Um, we actually dropped it back down to medium size. Um, I wasn't naturally at big anyways, so I'm not really too concerned about dropping to medium. I just hope that we're out of the shock phase. We're gaining pop by time of D.O.N. Um, it's possible that we aren't, but I doubt it. But, still, I think this was a good show of Dark. We move on to Dynamite. On to our show of Dynamite, we start off with mixed tag action as CM Punk and AJ Mendez defeat Orange Cassidy and Kylie Ray when AJ Mendez pins Kylie Ray. CM Punk being heads and shoulders above everyone else. Yeah, that makes sense. CM Punk is... So he's, you know, on the outside at this, and he heads into the ring after the match. He has a mic in hand. He compliments Orange Cassidy and Kylie Ray on a good performance, but he says 
that he wishes that Orange Cassidy showed off more of what he could do in the ring. And he says that, well, his lackadaisical attitude got, him, attitude? Attitude got him so popular. If Orange Cassidy wants to reach his potential, he's got to bring the fire that he has inside him that he is capable of showing even more. Punk offers to help train or train, cha train Orange Cassidy to get into a shape that CM Punk can say that Cassidy brought up his all at double or nothing at the end of the month. Orange Cassidy gives a thumbs up. He apparently has a new catchphrase. Um, we'll just say it's the thumbs up. He's not saying anything. Paul Heyman is then in his office. He looks more disappointed than anything. And he says, I'm a little bit hurt by your words, Chris. Maybe you're right that my practices haven't been the most reliable, but it's something that you can't deny. Since I've come to AEW, the ceiling has been raised tenfold, hundredfold, a thousandfold. No matter what you say is about me as a person, I'm someone that knows how to get AEW moving ahead. I'm someone that knows how to get a wrestling company moving ahead. And I'll have you know that it's not just money that brought Taz to my side. There's one more little thing. See, I know that money is not all that there is in pro wrestling. Sometimes you need the star power and you need the matches. I've promised him a match. I've promised Team Taz a match with a brand new signing, a brand new prospect for his team. But I think me revealing that surprise myself in words won't quite be enough to warrant the intended reaction. So I'll leave it up to our wonderful PR and graphics team to show that. But don't worry, Jericho. Don't worry, don't worry. I still do have plans for you. You've at least convinced me of that much. And who was that new signing? Antonio Lautens. Formerly known as Cesaro. Claudio Castagnoli. Now going as Antonio Lautens. Extremely remarkable. Good lord, that's a really... I know what? I'm fine with that. Small penalty to psychology is a little bit disappointing. But... He does need charisma. Extremely likable, I always am a fan of, but Antonio Lautens will be making his in-ring debut at Double or Nothing with Jeff Cobb. Uh, I'll just say that now. I'll probably have it revealed uh, at some point, or maybe it would just be one of those things that in kayfabe, it's on Twitter, uh, maybe Dynamite Dealings, they're like, hey, by the way, it's Jeff Cobb, they'll be taking on Lautens for his first match. After this, Chassis Blackheart defeats Lady Bernice. Afterwards, the Queen's Court, you know, as expected, rush into the ring and begin fighting with Shotzi, but they're stopped when Queen Lupa and Jasmine Duke rush out to assist Shotzi. They scare off the members of the Queen's Court, who scurry off defeated. And Shotzi is a little bit confused by this, but she accepts the arrival of Duke and Lupa. The three walk backstage together. This is going to be a six-woman tag match for next Dynamite. Big Swole is unseen in a vignette. Showing it that how since she's joined the bankroll, she's been, no pun intended, rolling in the money. She's been a star in commercials, she's been plastered all over New York City in Times Square, and just to rub it, it just to rub it a little bit of salt into the wound, she has a billboard promoting herself and the bankroll right outside Britt Baker's dental office in Pittsburgh. I think it's Pittsburgh that she's in. And she says that, as Swole is, says that, Britt Baker doesn't scare her whatsoever. She's not scared of a dentist. She's not a child. In fact, it should be Britt Baker who's scared of Big Swole. It's fine that Britt's not finished because they will finish things off at Mother's Day where the winner will not only have their pride, but they'll have the rights to the billboard outside Britt's practice. Truly the highest of stakes, the billboard outside of a dental office. Kevin Steen then defeats Colt Cabana. The sharpshooter? Steen uses a sharpshooter? What the? Hell? MJF walks up to the map, map, ramp, sarcastically clapping. He says, truly what an intimidating performance from Kevin Steen. You managed to beat someone who hasn't had a victory in AEW since November of 2020. Someone who the wrestling world forgot because he just isn't good. Someone that even at his best, even at his most relevant, was just relevant because he had some now buried beef, CM Punk. I can't say I'm impressed, but you know what, that's... Not really my concern. It's not my place to judge you for picking up cheap and easy wins. But how about you and your old time friend, Rami Sabay, make this a little bit interesting. I already know how good you two are at wrestling. I can't deny that you're good at wrestling. But there's more to this business of pro wrestling than what you can do in the ring. More to wrestling than, well, wrestling. 
I'll have one of my employees send you an itinerary of what's coming up, but you need to have more than just in-ring skills to truly say that you're better than me. So yeah, uh, non-wrestling segments. This will be fun. I'm gonna have fun with these, hopefully. After this, Kana's browsing through her phone when she sees the YouTube music video for Maki Ito's song about her. Uh, Kana actually seems to somewhat enjoy the song, and weirdly enough, you know, it's, it's weird she's laughing at herself being made fun of, uh, and she eventually just gets up from her seat in the locker room, heads off elsewhere. Camera lingers, kind of zoom, pans over, Mock and Abaddon are doing almost, like, I'm kind of imagining almost the Scooby-Doo spot where they have, I think it's Scooby-Doo that usually, where, you know, like, Abaddon, her head is, you know, like, peeking around the corner, Maki's head is right above that, I'm just like, god damn it, they're, Maki is especially sad that she didn't get under Kana's skin at all. Fred Yahi then defeats Zack Sabre Jr. with the Koji Clutch. And Antonio Banks steps out. He's a little bit confused, weirdly enough. He says, well, I guess we've seen something. All three of the best technical wrestlers in AEW have gone toe-to-toe, -to -toe and we're at a win and a loss, a win and a tie, and a tie and a loss. I mean, I can definitely say that since Gresham hasn't lost, it means he's done the best. I mean, he's won this little tournament, but I'm not satis as satisfied with that as I thought I would be. So, Zach, how does a rematch for next week sound? You versus Jonathan. I... Don't want any more ties in this. I want to have Jonathan be the definitive winner. And DFJ announced he agrees to the match. So that'll be set up for next week. After this, the Briscoes are actually not seen at their farm. They're instead seen at a nondescript location. And they say, y'all thought y'all was real clever, didn't you? Y'all gonna steal our belts, y'all trying to get under our skin. Y'all trying to get us to falter. When by any means necessary, you little hot honcho says, huh? If nothing else, you got yourselves a match. Bring them belts over next week. We're gonna let you have that goddamn title match you want so much, we're gonna whoop y'all's asses at that match. Or something like that, I don't know. Try to do a little bit more of the... a little bit more variant of things. Get a little bit more accents in there. After this, the Lucha Bros are seen in the LWO headquarters, chilling out in their masks, you know, as one does. They're into the private party burst sitting in, and while they don't physically destroy anything, they start spray painting the entire headquarters in an incredibly tacky color. It is awful to look at. Uh, the Lucha Bros rush downstairs, not because it looks awful, just because of the whole idea of them barging in and insulting the LWO. Private Party fight back, and they, you know, they start by tossing the spray paint cans at them. Honestly, it doesn't really do much to the Lucha Bros, but, you know, they kind of roll over, Godfather picks them, he starts spray painting. Uh, spray paint, spray painting, everything. Once both cans are out, he just drops them, runs out. Private party runs out. Lucha Bros, they're pissed off. They're looking around. It looks awful in here. Like it's. I'm imagining that not only do the colors themselves suck. Like Isaiah Cassidy brought in one color and then another color that doesn't match. Mark Quinn, another color that doesn't match with either of those two, and another color that doesn't match with either of those two. It just looks absolutely awful in here. A bit of a comedy segment admittedly, but moves the story along. And in our main event, Miro picks up the win in the dog collar match by submission. I'm kind of imagining that, like, I, I wasn't imagining this before, but now I kind of have this in my mind, that Miro, he he has the dog collar on, you know, they're, they're tied to each other, and, you know, obviously the, the accolade, the game over, I'm imagining he's using the dog collar to assist that. He's using the chain, because obviously you have to be pretty close in order to do that. He's using the chain to assist. Pac probably has used the brutalizer a little bit. Um, you know, cha that, that chain in the brutalizer. It's just a... Fa I mean, it should be a way better match than this, but I feel like I'm capped on my matches. Like, lack of psychology, both of these guys have really good psychology, so... I might have to check product settings, see if I can get anything better, but that was still just a really good show. Uh, I'm happy with that. Yeah, still no popular changes. Again, uh, drop down in size. Uh, I'm going to stay at medium size for a while, probably. Uh, even if I get up to the point where I could be big, I'm probably just going to keep myself at medium for a little bit longer. Um, just until I'm more confident, but good show, 77 rating. Uh, and we'll move on to Rampage.